Hey everyone, it is the Ted Show, and I'm here with the one and only uh, JJ Walcutt, Dr. JJ Walcutt. She has been on the show before, so she is an alum. I don't know that word, uh, but she has had a phenomenal ride, and I want to hear more about it because JJ Walcutt ran for U.S. president, uh, was a candidate for U.S. president. And she did a tour of the United States and came on and gave us a little bit of that. And now that that is over, um, that part is over. She's got a book. Uh, she's going to share her journey. And I'm just so happy to see her back. Hey, JJ, how you doing? I'm doing well. I think I actually have a picture of the book with me. Nice. <laughs> oh, it looks good. Who the F wants to be president, it. right? I mean, it's the right question these days. It's literally the right question. I don't know. I, I felt like you were a uh, glutton for punishment going out there as you did. Uh, and then the world got turned upside down with COVID. But give them just a bit of a background on you. Uh, tell them a little bit about you and then we'll take a deep dive. Sure. So, I, well, I think the question most people ask is, are you crazy? Right. And so <laughs> right off the bat, <laughs> you, you probably have to have a little bit of gumption in you to go do something like this. Um, but professionally, I come out of government. I left my job at the Pentagon. I was a U.S. delegate to NATO, Partnership for Peace. Um, I wrote policy and oversaw a huge team of research scientists. And so, you know, this is something that uh, I joked with one of the uh, interviews that I did for one of the newspapers. I said, no kidding, I could walk into the Oval Office tomorrow and in 24 hours we could have a team to deploy. And he said, oh, come on. And I said, no, I, I, I'm serious. There's a difference between what the job actually entails and politics. And for those of us in government, I said, you know, I know the programs. I know the people. I know how this system works. Um, but politics is a different animal. So uh, a bunch of us, you know, we kind of started figuring out that as government employees, even in military, there was a glass ceiling, if you will. You cannot actually move up in your job unless you go into politics and you can't finish your job or do your job unless you interact all with politicians. So I said, the heck with it. I'm gonna go figure out how all of this works. Um, and I quit my job, I bought an RV. I signed up with the uh, Federal Election Commission and drove all 50 states. Well, to be fair, I flew to Hawaii and to <laughs> People often ask, my dad said one, he goes, are you going to drive to Hawaii? I said, no, dad, I'm, I'm going to swim. I mean, you know, it would get you a lot of attention if you tried to swim. Yeah. I, I, no. love that you took on, I love that you took this on. I love, I love the fact that you went from being a government employee, contract employee, and then said, you know what, I have, I, I want to do something. But that, those two don't seem like they go together. A lot of, and I'm, I, I was a, a government employee for a while. So government employees tend to be very lifers. They like their job. They like the routine. They like, in my opinion, the monotony because I did it. Uh, it's very structured. You know, you got, if you're a cigarette smoker, you got two 15 ciggy breaks. Yeah. And so for you to jump from that structure to, Come the wild west, as far as I'm concerned. Oh, yeah. What was that like? I mean, you take first of all, you you leave your job, and then you decide I'm going to go on the trip. What was that like when you first got to the first spot? Did everything go? Did you go? Oh God, time out! I made a mistake here. This uh, is <laughs> terrified is definitely the right word. I we, we had no idea what we we're doing. You're, you're exactly right. I mean, it is so structured, and I, I worked defense. So you want to talk structure. I mean, we're used to very clear lines. And I went from somebody who people stood up when I walked in the room to, I'm sorry, who are you? Do I know you? Do you have any money? Can you name drop? And I thought, oh my goodness, did I, did I grow horns overnight? Um, so yes, it was a surreal experience. And I got to my first interview and I thought, I have no idea what I'm going to ask this man. I don't know what we're going to do, but um, it was wonderful. We stopped at the the way we structured it, because, of course, I had to impose some sort of structure, right? Of course you did. So, so every month we focused on a major issue area, because I figured the odds of actually becoming president were quite small, but the odds of adding to the conversation, questioning the system, figuring out how it worked, now that, that I could probably do. So the first month we focused on the environment, 
And we started right here in Florida at the Jacksonville Zoo and, and met with the director there. And he was fantastic. And we went through policy and we went through what's working in our communities and what's not and set the stage then for all the interviews around the country. So every day I interviewed somebody new. It might be uh, a guy at the RV um, place that we were staying <laughs> for the night. Uh, and then it might be one of the top experts in military readiness. It just depended on the day. So I went from right to left to in between to hates politics to skilled to unskilled and everything in between. And so then we took all those ideas and put them together and said, hey, we actually can solve these problems. And I'm not convinced we need Congress. It's kind of a daring statement. How, how did that go over? Well, you know, I, I think it's one, you know, if, there's, if there are big lessons, right? One of the biggest lessons in the tagline I say all the time is, it doesn't take an act of Congress to fix the country. It just takes a whole lot of dedicated Americans to work together. One day I was at, uh, we'd gone through one of the uh, hurricanes, you know, because we have a lot of those here. And I, I have a daughter um, that passed away. So we went to her cemetery to see how the trees had been affected. Because, you know, once they start falling, all kinds of bad things happen. And when we got there, uh, there, were, there were just people kind of milling about. We were all taking assessments. What's, what's happening? What's problematic? How do we fix it? And then we all came, went home, got our tools, came back. People didn't just bring like, shovels they brought backhoes and they brought commercial grade um uh the the chainsaws and, and all kinds of things and i thought see communities can come together and we can solve problems we didn't go file something with the government we don't didn't go ask for money we just took care of it um, and that idea i took everywhere and found over and over and over and over again that people are solving problems in their own communities we're just not highlighting them and we're not connecting them why are we not doing that? This is the part that makes me crazy. And well, there's a million parts. But <laughs> we're 100% right. We, there, are, there is so much good that actually goes on. And there is so much collaboration in our country. And yet, mainstream media, I've been picking on them lately. I love my friends. But mainstream media creates this divisiveness as a whole and then people only want to hear the negative or that's at least what we're told the audience only wants to hear the negative they don't want to hear the positive and so i just don't understand it, it tell me why is it just because of ratings and money yep okay. it's straight up ratings and money so it's very interesting to get into the political i know i'm so sorry to confirm what we all hoped wouldn't be the case um but the the truth is you know train wrecks sell and and people keep watching even when they hate it they keep clicking on it they keep it look, I, i'm guilty of oh yes thank you <laughs> i'm guilty you're the best alex um i'm guilty of looking at things like and i hate to even admit it um 90 day fiance <laughs> or, i mean you know it's it's this train wreck and so I say I'm not paying attention, but I could probably name everybody on there. It's not just, and so we do, we like this, we, we thrive on it sometimes. Um, I'm sure there's a whole psychology behind that. All right, there, so how no, yeah, and I'm a psychologist, right? So that's <laughs> my, my, my clinical background and knowledge of how the brain works came into play, right? Because we do this with, with military. We talk about human optimization. How do we make sure that the brain is operating at a level that's beyond the normal human capacity? Um, so getting into that space is a space I, you know, is near and dear to me. Then I start taking around the country and you start seeing we're doing the same things. We're just, we're our own worst enemy, I think is probably sometimes the case. And what's interesting, um, so the book is a bit punchy, obviously, given the headline, the title. Yes, and, tell us uh, the title again, because I put it there, but go ahead. Who the F wants to be president? <laughs> and it's it's a fair question. I mean, why would anyone want this job, Hussein? I, I think why? About it. Why did you? Did it, why did you want to? You you wanted to make a change, right? Is that what you wanted to do? I, I well, I think there's a difference between want and feel compelled. So <laughs> I, you know, I didn't serve in the military, but I often say I've been professionally raised by them. And what I mean by that certainly is some of the, the rigid hierarchy and, and the way that we do things in defense. Um, but part of it too is a sense of service. 
And so for me, uh, when my daughter passed, I said, um, I want to do something in her honor that gives back to our country, to our people. And I, I didn't know what that opportunity would be when this came across my desk and I thought, well, what the heck? You know, this is something that we can contribute. And I wanted to make a point that, number one, nobody wants this job. <laughs> I'd be willing to do it because I believe in service, but who would want it, right? And number two, the people that are most skilled, in other words, that could do the actual job, could never sell the tickets required to get there. I mean, the amount of money we figured out through uh, working with marketing folks and whatnot, 70 to 1. That's the ratio, meaning the Democrats were spending $70 for every single unique dollar they were getting from individuals. Wow. You're talking about money just circulating, 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 and more money being spent just to prove that you had enough single dollar donations in order to be able to get on stage and so on and so forth. There was not a single requirement that had anything to do with talent, skill, or capability to do the job to get on that stage. Everything came down to money. We have three chapters in the book. And at some point, I think it says something like, okay, if you're not sick yet, sit down, grab a beer, and keep going, because there's more money. We unpack all of the money issues, all of the struggles, um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So if you want to know how it works, but you don't want to repeat what I just did, <laughs> The book what is a you, read. What did you? What do you think? Some of the lessons. I mean, I'm sure it probably is in the book. But it, when you were sharing your journey the first time on the show, I thought, how courageous! This is this is a courageous thing to do for anyone to do and say, I'm going to do take on the challenge. Uh, I think you used the word compelled before. It, I feel like there's got to be when you get back. Obviously, who the F wants to be president is one of the lessons and thought processes you went through. But what did you learn? What did you take from it? Um, what did you learn, positive and negative? Give me one of each. Well, certainly the negative is the obvious one. The money is so substantial that, um, you know, we'd like to believe that our vote matters. And it, and it does to some extent from one from choice A to B. Um, but largely those choices are chosen for us. And so we think that's really disheartening. And I, I, th I think it's easy to think, well, then what the heck are we doing and how do we ever get out of this? So we right. think the flip side of that was the meaning that I found. And the meaning that I found was that everyday citizens, business owners, idea generators, professors at universities, um, people on the streets, anywhere I went, I found fresh thinking. I found honesty. I found people willing to help folks. Um, what we're seeing on TV right now is, I mean, it's nothing short of horrendous, but I guarantee you it doesn't represent everyone. There are a lot of people out there willing to listen right now who are eager to learn, who are willing to change the way they do things um, if they have some direction. So, what I really ended up taking away from it is that we have a group of politicians up here that can drive us all a little batty. And then we have a huge iceberg underneath that tip. That's really fantastic. And that that's what makes America cool. I agree. I, every, everywhere I've ever been, you can get anybody frothy about a topic. You want to <laughs> talk about something and you want to just, you want to push their buttons and do it? Yes. But the majority of the people want to talk about peace and prosperity and businesses doing well and family and doing good things for the world, the environment, fellow man. Most people I have met fall into that category. Uh, and yet we are constantly barraged with things about all of the negative. There, those people exist. And yes, they they can be powerful and impactful and oh, yeah. and hateful, but um, the majority of the people are not like that. And that's the part that I love that you um, just basically solidified for me is that uh, people really do want to help across the country. They do, and I, you know, I, I think if if there were any ability to make some changes um, that people could actually take, one is know that you're worth more than your vote. I say it all the time, your vote matters, you have to, you have to vote. <laughs> but beyond that, don't be discouraged. Recognize that in your community, and I, I talked to one of your colleagues last time we were on, and he said, 
JJ, it's not just about everything at the federal level. It's about the community level. I said, I know. <laughs> That's what I've actually been finding. Um, and I, I just did the work to go prove that, right? So I encourage everybody to get out. There. Whatever your talent is, for me, it's science, right? So my, my ability to contribute is to ask questions, to organize ideas into solutions for education or defense or environment. But for someone else, it's being an activist. And they can rally a, a crowd in ways that I tried as a cheerleader in high school Still can't do it. <laughs> but we need all of these groups, right? You know, we do need politicians with good hearts that are trying desperately to hold on to that uh, authenticity and their ethics. And we need activists and we need people who volunteer in their community. We also need our problem solvers who, you know, we're not as interesting, um, but we have a place in, in helping solve these problems. And I think if we did a better job recognizing that, I think we would see some some change. The other thing I would say is um, we don't do enough to get involved in government. You know, we, we get involved in politics. We don't always get involved in government. And I'll give an example. I was in Hawaii and um, there's a huge rally going on. So of course I had to join in. Of course. <laughs> And, and it was very interesting because most of the men had very little clothing. So I'm trying to do video and I'm like, oh, can't do that. Okay. <laughs> oh my God, I had to bring that a whole bunch. Um, but, <laughs> you know, little funnies from the but, um, It was very interesting. They were protesting something called the 30 meter telescope. So this is one of the largest telescopes um, in the world. The intention was to get into a very remote area of the country in order to be able to see beyond the lights of the, of the world. And so I understand the purpose of it. The problem is they wanted to put it on what is considered sacred ground to many um, native Hawaiians. Um, and so of course they're coming in now to protest if here's the problem. Money from other countries has already poured in. Policy has already been made. Approvals have already gone through Congress. So what actually is going to happen at this point? Right. We're going to have a lot of people come and put a lot of energy in. And I loved it. And I love the sincerity and I love to document it. But I also ask every single one of them. Have you ever been in government? Do you know anybody who's ever applied for a government job? Are you aware that you can volunteer for like an eight or 10 week um, service project in order to get involved? And of course, everyone said no. And I said, do you know how this decision could have been changed? Not your politician. It's somebody sitting at the table, at the government table, behind closed doors, nobody knows you exist, but the decision comes down and eight people sit around and go, yeah, that looks like the best place. Does anybody have any reason to say no? No, okay, let's move forward. And if you had been sitting there and said, wait a minute, I don't, I don't think that's a good place to build. Let's, let's do some more digging. You would have stopped it before the train ever took off. That's so interesting. I. I've been a government employee, your contract employee, but I didn't know that you could volunteer. Yes. So this is actually my third book in the last four years. <laughs> I kind of got into writing heavily. Um, the first book that I did was called Innovating Government, and you can download it for free. It's a government publication for anyone watching. You've already paid for it. You didn't know you were paying for it, but here's government dollars. Um, and so what I did is I went around and interviewed all of these government employees and looked for innovation programs all across the government. Little known fact, they are not easy to find. Did you know we, I think we have 179 innovation programs. Don't Who knew we were paying for this? I did not know that. What do they build? Does anyone in the administration know they exist? The answer is no. And that goes across both political groups. So I'm not insulting one or the other. There's no org chart. There's no connection of what they're building, making, thinking about, designing, funding, none of this. So we set out to go find it all. And one of the things we found was the virtual federal student service. Am I getting that right? Virtual, no, it's virtual student federal service. VSFS. You have to have acronyms. It's a requirement. Of course, yeah. uh, but if you Google it, you'll find that there are all these programs that you can participate in for like 10 weeks. And it's about five to 10 hours a week. The way they get around, because um, technically you're not allowed to volunteer. So they give you course credit. Doesn't really matter if you have a college descended to or not. Um, and you can be on a project for NASA or you can be on a project for the State Department. Oh, or, cool. Mm-hmm. 
And so when you do that, for anyone who hasn't ever been in government, you learn how the machine works and you learn how the workers work and you learn how the politics is played, how the money moves, how the line items work. So I, I think what you're saying, there's, there's opportunities out there, but people wouldn't know. So they could go to your, that innovative book and they could look or at least start there, correct? Yeah, so the, the innovation book actually is a redesign of the executive branch. So what we actually did is figured out how you could take all those programs across government, because there's 2.4 million workers, unbelievable number, and you could orchestrate connections to citizens who have great ideas and businesses or whether it could just be a citizen at home who has a great idea um, and actually move the information through government so it actually benefits all people. I mean, one of the interesting things is we fund research projects. I did this one time where I went into Department of Ed and they had like a science fair basically where all of these awardees came in and showed their projects. Some of them were amazing. And I would ask, this is so great. How are you making sure everybody in the country has it? Because schools would love this. Oh, uh, we got five schools in our district to use it. <laughs> are, you, are you kidding me? We spend a million dollars and you got five schools to benefit from the program? Oh my goodness. So you multiply that times 100, 150, 100 to 150 million dollars and a handful of schools around the country get to benefit from unconnected that's unconnected is the word. There's a disconnect okay. for sure. Yeah. All for right. Sure. I, am, I am sure I'm going to assume that this whole experience changed you in some way, shape or form. So share with us. What, what are you doing as you're moving into the next phase, whatever that is? And I'd love for you to share. What are you doing differently because of how you were changed? What am I doing differently? I, I think differently. Um, I ask different questions now. I don't assume that what I see on TV is accurate by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I, I often say that it, it's fascinating to watch the different, uh, the different networks because each of them gets roughly three puzzle pieces uh, chosen at random out of a thousand piece puzzle. And of course they've each chosen three different ones and then from there, they try and paint you an entire picture of the puzzle. Neither side having any clue what the puzzle is. <laughs> no idea whatsoever. So no. then you have this back and forth argument. And I, I constantly say to people, just take a moment and assume that you have such a small amount of information through no fault of anyone's own, but nonetheless, right. so little information that uh, it's like those multiple choice questions we had when we were kids not D, not enough information to make a decision, right? Um, so I would say that's that's a big one. Um, the other one, actually, this is where I've probably been challenged. Um, I think at the, I think at a global level now, right? I think about how all the systems, how, uh, you know, in the environment, the problem is not so much that we don't have enough money or good ideas or good science, is that the scientists are not very good at translating it into actionable goals that make politicians look good so that they send the money to the right place. Right? So it's this, this human level problem, not a science problem. Um, so that's been challenging because then coming back to, okay, now what do I do for a job next? Right. I mean, who, who, who solves some, who wants to hire somebody who does um, national level problem solving? Uh, I don't know, I would imagine. <laughs> I would think there'd be a lot of people who would want that. I, I, that assumes they want the problem solved. Why uh, would a politician uh, want to have the problem solved? What would we argue about? <laughs> I mean, this is no, this is. I know, I know it's true. I, I know it's true, and that's the the thing is, is that it's it's. Part, I think everybody sort of knows it, JJ. I think everybody kind of has that. Uh, which unfortunately leads to some of that apathy you mentioned earlier of, you know, get out and vote because people are like, it doesn't matter what I do. And in some respects, they're a thousand percent right. Um, the, what did you say? You're bigger than your vote. And I think if people took that to heart and really um, had that in the back of their mind when they were making decisions, all right, you don't want to vote? Well, then get out. Don't be part of the problem and do nothing. Yeah. Right. part of the solution. So what is next? 
Uh, well, I started a podcast called The Nerdy Truth. Um, so I'm continuing the interviews that I did uh, because I would like to highlight the citizen innovation that lives ar around this great country of ours. Um, and what I would really like to do is get into a space where we're connecting all of those. So, so I'm at the point of you know starting my own business and and connecting with folks. We just uh, were working with the Air Force and looking at how do we move knowledge across the entire Air Force system. I mean that sounds simple. You just put it out there into a repository and everybody can access it. Not simple. Everybody uses a different computer. Everybody thinks a little bit different. They turn over people every three years. It gets very complicated. And in the military and the defense world, everything is about information at this point. So there's 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 a lot coming. Well, uh, we'll we'll see where we exactly land. Um, well, I'm excited for you. All right, what's the best way for people to uh, get your book? Um, is it the website teamjjusa.com? Learn more about you. Uh, yes, you can go there. Um, it's just backslash book. Uh, you can also just go on Amazon and Google it. I will say we have a little glitch at the moment due to COVID. Um, we had to make an edit, and so now they're they're moving a little bit slow <laughs> on on getting it out. But it is it is available directly through um, through Amazon, and you can just look up who the f wants to be president. And I mean, it's it's for anyone who wants to understand the system or who wants to take a trip around the country. We highlight every single state and talk about the citizens and what we find. And for anybody who wants something actionable. You know, enough with the argument, enough with trying to take one side or the other. This is not uh, partisan. I mean, I had to pick a side in order to run. That's a requirement. But don't get hung up on that. You know, I'm as, I'm as middle of the road as they come. I listened to everybody and highlighted everybody. The goal really is to say there's something we can actually do about this. Um, but you got to take a couple hours, think through it, and take action. So it's good news. Love it. All right. I love that you came back on the show. Thank you so much. I think what you did is, I said it earlier, so courageous and wonderful and eye-opening. You all go out and get the book, Who the F Wants to Be President. I love it. And she's speaking from the heart. JJ Walcott, thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Ted. All right. See you guys soon. Good luck in all your travels. You got to come back. Talk, talk to us more. I love your story. You guys, reach Absolutely. out to her. Absolutely. <laughs> AJUSA.com. All right, we'll see you later. Bye.